All right, so let's talk a little bit about, in chapter one, let's talk a little bit about the terms anatomy and physiology. Um, let's talk about what they mean, and uh, we're also going to talk about why we study them typically together. Um, so we're going to start off with anatomy. Um, what is anatomy? Anatomy is the study of the structure. of your body parts. So what do they look like? What are the parts and pieces? What are the relationship of parts? Like for example, if you look at the heart, we can study the anatomy of the heart. Um, what are all of the chambers in the heart? What are all of the vessels going into and out of the heart? What is the structure of that particular organ? So that's anatomy. Now we actually can break anatomy down into different types. So one type of anatomy is called gross or macroscopic anatomy. The term macro means big. So gross anatomy is basically anything that you can see with your naked eye. So the heart example I just gave you would be an example of gross or macroscopic anatomy. Microscopic anatomy, micro means small. So microscopic anatomy is looking at structures that are too small to be seen with the naked eye. You have to have a microscope to view these. Developmental anatomy is going to look at how your structures change through a course of development. Um, so a lot of times we'll look at developmental anatomy, particularly in the early embryonic stages of development and in the fetal stages of development. And then lastly we have some special branches of anatomy that we'll walk through as well. So let's go through each of those um, types of anatomy. We're just going to talk about them in a little more detail. So remember gross or macroscopic anatomy is looking at structures that are large enough that you can see them with your eye. You don't need a microscope. And we actually can break this down into three different ways to view gross anatomy. One is regional. This means we're going to look at all of the structures in one particular part of the body. So let's say, for example, we cut off my right arm and we're going to look at all the structures that are just in my right arm, right? So obviously we can see skin. We peel the skin back and we're going to see things like muscle. We'll see blood vessels. We'll see nerves. We'll see bone. These are all things we can see with our naked eye and they're all in that particular region. Now we can also look at gross anatomy in a systemic fashion, meaning we are looking at the structures in the organ system. So if we think of organ systems, um, we've got things like the nervous system. The nervous system is basically your brain, your spinal cord, and all the nerves that come off the brain and spinal cord. We could look at, for example, the digestive system, which is going to include all the anatomical structures from your mouth all the way out through the anus. Okay, So we can look at them by system. We can look at structures by region. We can also look at surface anatomy. Now I'm going to star this one because this is one where a lot of you, if you're going into healthcare, this is what you're going to use the most. This is looking at internal structures and how they relate to the skin. Um, a great example of that is going to be um, in your neck, sort of at the bottom of your neck, you have this little divot um, and it's right at the top of your sternum. And we call that the jugular notch. And this is actually a landmark that, that a lot of respiratory therapists might use if they have to insert a trach tube. They're going to go right here because this is below your voice box. It's below your larynx, so there's nothing that's going to get hurt here. And at this point, you don't have any major vessels, so you don't have to worry about cutting into any major arteries or vessels here as well. Um, and so we use surface anatomy a lot in the healthcare field, right? Same thing if you're trying to find somebody's vein so that you can draw blood. Um, a lot of times you'll either look with your eye for that vein and more often than not you're going to feel and palpate for that vein um, because again it's going to change what the skin looks like on top and how the skin feels. So those are the three ways that we can look at large structures, by region, by organ system, or through the surface of the body.
Now remember, we also have microscopic anatomy. This is looking at structures that require a microscope. They are too small to be seen with the naked eye. And so two examples of these that we'll actually do at the very beginning of the semester are cytology. Now I want to break this word down for you real quick. So ology is the study of, right? So like biology is the study of bio and bio is life. So cytology is the study of sight, and the prefix sight always means cell. Same thing with histology. Ology is the study of, and the prefix hist means tissue. So both of these things, cells and tissues, these are much too small to be seen with the naked eye. If we want to look at these, we're typically going to section them and we're going to put them on a microscope slide and look at them underneath a microscope. Okay. Now I do want to mention, you'll, you'll notice a lot throughout the semester in these little videos that I will try to break large words down for you into their prefixes, their suffixes, and their root words. By knowing these combining forms, it really helps you to understand a lot of these anatomical terms. Um, you may find a term you've never seen before, but if you know what a prefix and what the suffix and the root word are, then you can probably figure it out. Um, now in your textbook, the front and back cover of your book have a list of all these different combining forms, so it's a great resource. So we have done gross anatomy, we've done microscopic anatomy, we also have developmental anatomy. This is going to trace any kind of structural change that happens in the body throughout your life. Now again, I mentioned this earlier, but the most common form of developmental anatomy that we really study a lot is in that early embryonic fetal development period. So this is what's called embryology. Again, here's that ology. So we're studying embryos. We are looking at the developmental changes that happen before birth. Now, most people may not realize this, um, but uh, when a woman is pregnant, she is pregnant for three trimesters. And the first trimester is essentially when um, that egg is fertilized by the sperm and it forms a developing embryo and it's called an embryo up until about the second trimester, at which point we start referring to it as a fetus. Um, and so that developing embryo, there is so much that's happening. Um, usually within the fourth week of development, the brain and spinal cord have already started forming. Um, and a lot of people don't know this, but by the time a woman is considered four weeks pregnant, that is essentially the day she misses her period. So when you miss your period, you are already considered four weeks pregnant, at which point the brain and spinal cord have already started forming. That's one of the very first organ systems to form. So there's a lot of changes and developmental changes that happen, especially in that first trimester. This is also why any kind of maternal exposure to alcohol, drugs, toxins, even viruses, having running a, a high fever, all of these things can really affect the development of that embryo and fetus, okay? especially early on in pregnancy. All right, that was a little off topic. The last of the uh, types of anatomy that I want to walk you through are just some special types of anatomy. Um, a lot of times these are used, um, not really in our class, but they'll probably be more used for things like research um, or even diagnosing medical conditions. So the first one I have listed is pathological anatomy. Um, I want you to think about that word pathological. Think pathogen. A pathogen is a disease causing agent. So this would be looking at structural changes that happen to your anatomy when you are sick, when you have a disease. Um, you know, we are all living through this pandemic right now, and um, I know everybody is worried about, you know, if you get COVID, we don't really know the long-term issues with this virus. Um, and so they're really studying the pathological anatomy. What is it doing to the lungs? Are there any structural changes that are happening? We know tuberculosis, for example. Tuberculosis is a bacterium that gets into your body and it sort of hibernates in your lungs. 
and it'll cause big tubercles to form in the lungs. This is how it gets the name tuberculosis. It makes breathing incredibly difficult. So we know there are anatomical changes that happen with certain diseases. Radiographic anatomy, this is looking at internal structures um, without ever cutting you open. So maybe using an x-ray. And x-rays are a great way to look at really hard calcified tissue like bone. So we can take an x-ray and see, for example, if you have broken a bone. But x-rays aren't really great at looking at soft tissue. So, for example, if they think that someone has maybe um, a brain tumor, they would not do an x-ray. They're not going to be able to see that soft tissue. Instead, they would do an MRI or a CT scan. So these are going to look at the soft tissues of your body. So this is a great way to look internally without cutting someone open. It's much less invasive. And then the last one is molecular biology. This is looking at anatomical structures at a subcellular level. So let's think about that. Um, a cell is the smallest unit of life. Um, it is the smallest living structure in our body. Molecular biology is looking at a subcellular level. So it's looking at things that are below or under. That's what sub means, right? Think submarine. So it's looking at things that are smaller than a cell. So think back to general biology, and I want you to think of all the macromolecules that we use to make cells. We use phospholipids, um, we, we use carbohydrates, we use proteins, we have DNA and RNA. All of these things, all of these big macromolecules come together to create our cells, right? Think about lipids. These are big fats. Our plasma membrane is made of a phospholipid bilayer. And so molecular biology looks at those. It's going to look at lipids, carbohydrates, DNA, RNA, proteins, but it's not necessarily looking at the whole cell. It's looking more at the components of the cell. Okay. So we've gone through anatomy. Now let's walk through physiology. Physiology is the study of the function. Sorry, it connects those together. It's the study of the function of our body parts. So anatomy is looking at the structure. What does it look like? Physiology is how is it working? What is it doing? So physiology is a little different in terms of how we study it. So remember in anatomy, we can study anatomy by region, right? chop off my right arm and look at all the structures in my arm. We can study it by organ system. So we can study anatomy different ways. Physiology, we always, always study physiology by organ system. And that makes sense to me. Um, you know, if we tried to study physiology by region, like chopping off that right arm, well, we would have to know how the muscles work. We would have to know how bones can grow and remodel. We have blood vessels in there, so we would have to know what the blood vessels are doing, how the blood moves. We, would, we also have um, nerves. We would have to know neur neurophysiology, and that's just too much. So instead, we always focus physiology on organ system. So for example, when we study your blood vessels, we basically look at the heart and the blood vessels. Um, when we study bones, that's all we study. So we do it by organ system, and it just makes it a little bit easier um, to put it all together. A lot of times when we look at physiology, we are looking at physiology from a cellular level and even a subcellular level. So we are looking on a molecular level. Now here are just some examples of physiology. Um, we have physiology for every single organ system that we cover this semester and in AP2 as well. So renal physiology, this is basically looking at kidney function. So how are your kidneys filtering your blood? How are they removing wastes and toxins from your bloodstream? Neurophysiology, this is basically looking at how your nervous system works. How do neurons fire? How do they send signals? What's happening? And then cardiovascular physiology is essentially the heart and your blood vessels. 
Now we will um, get into neurophysiology this semester, but we won't get into renal physiology or cardiovascular physiology until anatomy two. Now the last thing I want to mention in this little video is something called the principle of complementarity. This is just that a lot of times, now that we know what anatomy and physiology are, a lot of times when you take a class, it's anatomy and physiology. We don't typically separate the two. Like for example, you don't just take an anatomy class. You don't just take a physiology class. It's really hard to separate the two. Um, and the reason for that is that the function, so how something works, remember this is physiology, always reflects the structure, the parts and pieces, that's anatomy. So I put some pictures in here just as examples. A good example is the heart. So how your heart works, how blood actually moves through the heart. You can't look at the function of the heart without knowing all of those structures, without knowing all of the chambers and all of those large vessels and all of the parts and pieces of the heart. So you can't understand how it's working without knowing the anatomy. Same thing, I have a skeleton here. Um, and this one is a pretty easy example. Um, if we think about the elbow joint, if you were to look at the elbow joint um, and look at how the elbow joint functions, how it moves, you can essentially move your elbow in one plane. You can flex and extend, that's all you can do. Your elbow doesn't rotate, you can't, it, it doesn't have biaxial movement, you can't move it in different planes like your hip joint or your shoulder joint. Um, it's just one movement, one range of motion, flexing and extending, that's it. The reason for that function of the elbow joint has to do with the anatomy of the joint and how those bones in your elbow fit together and what they look like. So you can't talk about how that joint's moving without also looking at the anatomy. And so this is the principle of complementarity, okay? We always study anatomy and physiology together.